O.J. Simpson. Fact or fiction? We got bad blood. There was blood everywhere. At the Bundy crime scene. At Simpson's Rockingham estate. Blood, prosecutors say, is Simpson's. It's also an indictment of the absolute incompetence and sloppiness of the criminalists, the coroner's office, and the rest of it. And what we've had exposed under the Klieg lights of this defense team that was well fueled by Mr. Simpson's money is the absolute second, third-rate performance that we get out of our system on a daily basis and for which many people are behind bars today. They did not give their criminalists training in state-of-the-art techniques. There was no DNA training for the evidence collectors. I believe you said, Ms. Mazzola, that the only training you've received in collecting bloodstains is, is for serological testing in general and not for DNA testing in particular. Is that right? Not in DNA in particular. That's correct. Are there any written guidelines that you have received from the LAPD dealing with any of the particular problems encountered with DNA evidence? No, I don't believe so. You stated that your understanding of the section in the LAPD manual on preserving wet stains is only instructions for final packaging, not temporary packaging. Is that right? That's correct. Is there any place in the actual rule listed in the LAPD manual that creates that exemption for temporary packaging? I don't know. I haven't read it. You've never read the LAPD manual section on how to preserve wet stains? That's is that what you're saying? That's correct. We know. When you take the swatches and you put them in plastic bags and you cook them for seven hours, you degrade the DNA. And as we went through it, Dr. Cotton admitted it, Gary Sims admitted it, everybody admits it. It's fundamental. You can degrade the DNA so that there's none left that is detectable. And if you cross-contaminate it with another sample from a reference tube from high concentration DNA, and remember, we're not talking about very much, the highest amount here is an RFLP test by cell mark of 25 nanograms. That is, you know, such a small amount, less than a, a drop, a very small speck can create 25 nanograms of high molecular weight DNA. You began collecting the blood drops at Bundy at what time? Approximately 11 o'clock, 11.30, around then. And you began putting them in plastic bags around 11 o'clock, 11.30, you and Ms. Mazzola? Approximately. And you put those plastic bags inside coin envelopes? Yes. And you put the coin envelopes eventually into a large brown paper bag? Yes. And you put those brown paper bags on the floor of the crime scene processing truck at some time that afternoon? Yes. And the sun was shining? The sun was shining. And it was hot inside that truck? There were periods when I went out to the truck to make sure it wasn't getting too hot. But, well, by what means? By opening the doors and waving your hands there? Periodically, I would go to the truck to see if it was getting hot or not. Well, it was getting hot, wasn't it? It was getting warm. And <clears throat> you did not begin the process of taking those wet blood stains out of those plastic bags until around 6.30 in the evening? Yes. So you had those wet stains in the plastic bags from, I guess your estimate is somewhere around 11.30 in the morning until 6.30 in the evening? Yes. That would be something on the order of seven hours? Yes. Is there a refrigerator in the crime scene processing truck? There is one, yes. Didn't use that? No. That is because the refrigerator doesn't well, it stops working after several hours. It, it doesn't keep working. Now you've heard testimony with respect to the practices of the LAPD crime laboratory personnel, Mr. Fountain, Ms. Mazzola, and Mr. Yamauchi, 
with respect to changing gloves. Are you familiar with that? Yes. As a microbiologist and DNA laboratory director, do you believe that analysts handling blood samples should routinely change their gloves between handling each item? Yes, I believe they should do that. And why? Especially with a technique like PCR, this is such a, a sensitive technique, you might not even notice that you have a small amount of blood or even an aerosol of that blood on your glove. And unless you change the glove, you can't eliminate the possibility that you might have transferred that to the next sample. The single worst thing that was done, and that is handling Mr. Simpson's reference tube at the same time that you were processing the swatches and the glove. And on cross-examination, he said something that was really remarkable. Do you recall this? All of a sudden, he said, I remember now. I opened up the tube, and the blood spurted up through the creme wipe. And it got on my gloves. All right. <clears throat> and you now can tell us that you made the blood swatch card before you examined the glove. Judging by, by the continuity of my notes, and uh, the next page entrance here that you pointed out, I would say, yeah, that's the most likely scenario. Is your memory of those events handling Mr. Simpson's blood vial improving since August? Well, the way you're making me think about it right now, I had to remember back to what I did with those gloves, and now I recall I had those gloves in my hand, they had blood on them. I would have to get rid of them and I couldn't get rid of them right in that area at that time. I had to go around and either put them into the receptacle behind me or take it back to serology to dispose of those gloves. And somehow or another, that's what reminds me of taking off my gloves at that point. Did you get blood on your gloves when you opened Mr. Simpson's reference tube? Yes, soaked through the paper. You, you remember that now? Yes, I do. In other words, didn't you testify before that if you opened the tube, you did it with a chem wipe? Yes, and the blood soaks through the chem wipe. And that's something that you didn't even recall when you were asked about this on direct examination. Was I asked that specifically? Well, do you recall being asked how you handled Mr. Simpson's reference tube on direct examination and giving a description? Yes, I, I recall describing that process. And when you gave that description, did you include the fact that the blood went right through the chem white and got your gloves dirty? No, I don't believe so. Now, he was a little vague about what he did with the gloves. He doesn't remember whether he put them in a biohazard bag right in the evidence processing room or got out and went to the serology lab and got rid of them there. But all of a sudden, we now know there was a spillage of blood there. Now, that is extraordinarily significant because there's plenty of high molecular weight DNA in the smallest drop to, if you get it on your gloves or if you don't change the gloves. And frankly, I think there's no reason to believe he did to contaminate these samples that we know are degraded. And we didn't put the department on trial, the department put itself on trial by doing things in the, in the, in a very poor fashion that it did. I mean, but once this uh, so-called mountain of evidence was turned over to the Los Angeles Police Department Scientific Investigation Division, they did everything they could to compromise or corrupt or, or completely just, you know, wreak havoc on this evidence. They took none of, they followed none of the normal scientific standards and rules. Um, and you had evidence which really wasn't worth anything. And that's what became very, very clear to the jury. What the LAPD is going to have to do after this trial is completely overhaul their laboratory division. They need new personnel in there. It should be run by civilians, not by law enforcement. They should bring in people with PhDs and people with the proper training to uh, bring this laboratory up to the 21st century. It's not there now. And it's got a long way to go.
Advances in DNA technology since 1995 are quite extraordinary. However, back in 1995, the use of DNA in forensic science was in its infancy. It was just seven years prior that the FBI first used the RFLP DNA technique in its casework. In 1993, two years before the Simpson trial, the FBI began using the DQ-alpha PCR technique. These are the two DNA techniques used in the Simpson case. RFLP is a well-studied, time-consuming test that can show with a very high degree of certainty that two samples are from the same person. RFLP requires 50 nanograms of DNA. PCR requires one half of one nanogram of DNA. PCR is better for showing someone did not commit a crime than for showing guilt. PCR is highly sensitive and susceptible to cross-contamination. Here's a quick look at how PCR works. The basics of the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. It's one of the most common techniques used in molecular biology. It is a quick way to amplify minute quantities of DNA to obtain millions of copies of DNA molecules. DNA polymerases used in PCR originate from thermophilic microorganisms and, therefore, are heat resistant. High temperatures are needed to melt or separate the double-stranded DNA. This separation then allows the DNA polymerase to synthesize complementary DNA strands. The technique was first published in 1985, and a Nobel Prize was awarded to Kerry Mullis for his invention of the PCR method. In 1988, the first PCR machine was introduced to the market. Since then, many improvements have been made to the reagents and instrumentation researchers use to perform PCR. Mullis and his colleagues at CETUS furthered PCR through the 80s and partnered with Roche to develop it for diagnostics. Roche later acquired the patents from CETUS and launched its first FDA-approved PCR test in 1993. Over the years, PCR has been steadily and systematically improved. The PCR technique known as DQ-alpha was developed in 1991. The FBI began using this technique in their casework in 1993. In 1994, LAPD started performing the DQ-alpha PCR technique in their casework. However, LAPD did not train their criminalists in the collection of DNA evidence. LAPD did not have a uniform set of rules for criminalists to perform PCR testing. PCR is highly sensitive, which makes the process incredibly susceptible to cross-contamination. Corporations continue to invest significant resources in developing technology to minimize cross-contamination in PCR testing. There have been enormous advances in PCR technology since 1995, back when PCR was still in its infancy. Cross-contamination continues to be a significant issue, as we will see in this video from Thermo Fisher Scientific. After the narrator shares each tip for avoiding cross-contamination, you will see either a green check or a red X on the screen to indicate if this was a practice followed by LAPD criminalists Colin Yamauchi when handling Mr. Simpson's reference sample, the Rockingham glove, and the Bundy blood drops on June 14, 1994. PCR is highly sensitive, and that's a good thing. But the downside is that trace amounts of contaminating DNA may lead to amplification of competing nonspecific products. Contamination usually comes from two sources, cross-contamination with non-amplified material from the environment or samples, or carryover contamination from an earlier PCR reaction. Let's first review some steps you can take to control cross-contamination. Wear a clean lab coat and gloves when performing PCR. Change gloves frequently. If possible, maintain separated areas for nucleic acid sample preparation, PCR setup, and PCR amplification. The PCR setup should have a laminar flow hood equipped with a UV lamp to prevent bacterial growth. Decontaminate all surfaces by wiping down PCR equipment, workstations, and pipettes with cleaning agents such as DNA Zap solution or a 2% bleach solution. Generously spray and wipe up the cleaning agent. This should be done before and after each PCR experiment. Use a dedicated set of pipettes and use aerosol-resistant tips. Always use sterile, ultra-pure water for dilutions and PCR reactions. Always prepare positive and negative control samples for every PCR run. Dr. Gerdes came in and he did an extensive study of the LAPD lab. He spent hundreds of hours reviewing data, doing an inspection. And what he found 
is that there was a cesspool of contamination in this laboratory. How can you just assume they're doing everything right when we can prove they're doing everything wrong? The next part that has particular relevance is the whole issue of contamination by control. When he examined the controls, there were controls that would show that there was contamination going on at the extraction process, that is, in the evidence handling, the EPR, the evidence processing room stage. And based on this data, he made the assessment that the contamination problem in LAPD is happening in that evidence processing room stage when they're handling the samples. Thank you. So we have proven that they are not entitled to any assumption of regularity in that evidence processing room in the way they handle the samples because they are getting this contamination all the time. Now, Ms. Clark said, well, if there were contamination, if there were DNA flying around from Mr. Simpson's sample, then we would have seen proof somewhere else that his blood had contaminated other samples. That's what we would have seen. Well, there was. On June 15th, a second set of samples was handled by Mr. Yamauchi. He had the reference tube from Nicole Brown Simpson, the reference tube from Ronald Goldman, and he had item number 12, which were the bl three blood drops picked up at the foyer in Mr. Simpson's residence. Those were the last drops picked up that day. They were the ones that were last put in a plastic bag, and Gary Sims has told us those are the ones that had the highest DNA concentration of any of the samples. Item number 12. They are the one that got an RFLP result from Cellmark. So we know that item number 12 is high concentration DNA. We know that item number 12 was being handled by Mr. Yamauchi on June 15th with the reference samples of Goldman and Nicole, which were also high concentration samples. And Dr. Gurdy showed you how at LAPD, and then on the polymarkers at Cellmark, and then at DOJ, we got typings that were consistent with cross-contamination from item number 12. And all the controls on those second uh, days, those negative controls, are clean. Because, as I'll discuss in a second, we've already proven these things happen with negative controls being clean. You get this cross-contamination. So. This was proof that Mr. Simpson's DNA, by sloppy handling, was cross-contaminated and typed lab after lab. And you heard that on cross-examination, Mr. Clark didn't even confront Dr. Gertie's with this board. And you know, he's a fine lawyer, and he knows this subject matter well. He didn't cross him on it because they can't touch it. In order for this to be true, the only thing they can say is, well, there was an extraordinary series of artifacts that accounted for some of it, but it didn't account for this uh, polymarker typing. That can't be an artifact. It's proven. Thank you. And not refuted. You're never going to see another case with so much DNA evidence as this case. There never has been. There never will be. I mean, there's virtually hundreds of pieces of evidence that went to the guilt of O.J. Simpson. Most people go to prison on one, one drop. They go to death row. And here we couldn't convict a man with hundreds of pieces of evidence that only pointed to one person, him. This is sugar. One single grain of sugar is approximately 625,000 nanograms. This is a drop of blood. There are between 500 and 1,000 nanograms of DNA in a single drop of blood. We were able to engrave the entire Bible on a surface so small that it can sit on your fingertip. We have created a nano Bible.
The whole Hebrew Bible is engraved on a gilt silicon a pinhead size. You'd have to magnify the words about 10,000 times before you could read them. And in a microliter of DNA, you would have, expect to find about 20 nanograms. Microliter well, of said, DNA? Micro, a microliter of blood, my apologies. In a microliter of blood, yes, it would be about 20 nanograms. And a microliter of blood would produce a spot about the size of a pinhead. Yes. A microliter of blood is the size of a pinhead, exactly the same size as the Nano Bible. 84.1 nanograms of O.J. Simpson's DNA was collected from Bundy on June 13th. How many Nano Bibles would that be? What is the number? The number is four. Four. One. Two, three, four. 84.1 nanograms, the entire amount of DNA that matched O.J. Simpson collected from Bundy on June 13th could fit on a fraction of the tip of your finger. These four little dots, it's everything. That's all the blood from O.J. that was found at Bundy on June 13th. That's it. Assuming that uh, number 52, that is the, uh, LAPD item number from which the RFLP was performed. Okay. Is that right? Yes. Well, you would agree that 20 nanograms would come from one microliter of blood. One fresh microliter of blood, not fresh. necessarily a, a blood stain. Right, one fresh microliter of blood. Right. And that's the size of a pinhead. That's right, but now you're talking about a volume of blood as opposed to if you were to spot about, I think I mentioned yesterday, if you were to look at a blood stain of about a millimeter by a millimeter, which is about a pinhead, you'd usually recover about two nanograms. So it's, it's the recovery is, is not always the same. I mean, it's one thing to talk about a stain and, <clears throat> excuse me, how much... DNA you'd get out of a stain versus if you were to look at the DNA in a volume of liquid blood. Right. There is a difference. There, there is a difference, and, and, and the difference is, uh, has to do with the DNA content of the volume you're dealing with. Well, it's, it's, no, I'm trying to distinguish between a volume of liquid whole blood yes. and what you can extract out of that versus what you typically would get out of a blood stain on a garment or something like that. But the point is, is that to the extent that you put an amount of, you extract DNA from amount of blood, right? Yes. Uh, the amount of DNA you can get out of the amount of, uh, the, the volume of blood is dependent on uh, the, uh, uh, the number of cells within that volume of blood uh, from which you can extract DNA. Yes. And if you have blood with a comparatively high content of DNA per volume, you're going to get a bigger yield. Yes. You agreed, I think you're saying, that you would expect to find, for example, in a reference tube, in the volume of blood in a reference tube, a higher yield of DNA content from uh, uh, a volume than you would from a stain that had been uh, picked up off uh, a dirty substrate and put in a plastic bag and degraded oh, okay. for seven yes. hours, yes. right? Yes, the answer to that is yes. yes. Okay. And so when you take blood from uh, samples that have a higher DNA content, right, the blood, assume the blood has a higher DNA content, you cross-contaminate it onto something else that has virtually no DNA content or not a detectable DNA content, you're going to get um, the yield from the volume of blood that has the higher DNA content. Infection's compound, it's unintelligible. Do you understand the question, Mr. Sims? Actually, that one I think I do. All right, go ahead. Uh, the an I think the answer to that is yes. Thank you. <laughs> And you now can tell us that you made the blood swatch card before you examine the glove. 
judging by, by the continuity of my notes and uh, the next page entrance here that you pointed out, I would say, yeah, that's the most likely scenario. In reviewing your notes, you agreed that you could have cut samples from the glove before you cut swatches from the Bundy samples. Yes. G could you give us the numbers of the, e the evidence items that you processed on the morning of June 14th? Okay, again, referring to my notes, the evidence item number 52, 49, 50, 48, 47. And according to my notes, sampled between 10 and 11, approximately, on the 14th of June, 1994. Now, the Bundy blood drops were samples that were, su were degraded. Yes? Question? Yes? Question? Yes. To use the terminology that I believed you employed the last time we spoke about this. Yes. You agreed that 47, 48, 49, and 50 were substantially degraded. Yes, that's the right term. Right? That's the term. And as to sample 52, you prefer to use the term degraded as opposed to substantially degraded because an RFLP test uh, rendered a result with cell mark. Yes, I think that's, that's somewhere where we ended up. Are you familiar with Mr. Yamauchi's testimony that in processing the Rockingham glove and the LAPD items 47, 48, 49, 50, and 52 in the morning of June 14th, that he did not routinely change laboratory paper between those items? Yes, I'm familiar with that. Is that a sound laboratory practice? It creates unacceptable risks. Listed on this chart are only items 48, 50, and 52. Is that correct? Correct. In terms of what was handled by Colin Yamauchi between 9 o'clock and 11 on the morning of June 14th were samples 47, 48, 49, 50, 52, and the Rockingham glove all sampled at that time with Mr. Simpson's reference sample. That's correct. Right. And where did that occur? That occurred in the evidence processing. And on June 14th, in the morning, did Mr. Fung and Ms. Mazzola scrape out of test tubes using a pipette without changing gloves and without changing paper, put into bindles the swatches that they had previously dried on June 13th? They did. What is your opinion about the way that Mr. Fung and Ms. Mazzola handled those samples on June 13th and on June 14th in terms of the danger of cross-contamination? I think there's significant risk of cross-contamination because they didn't change gloves, because they create aerosols when they try and scrape these little swatches out of the tube, because they handle the reference sample at the same time as uh, all of these other evidence items. And because certain items, a number of items, in fact, were mixed between crime scenes in terms of being handled at the same time. Are you familiar with the testimony and the records concerning the collection of the items at Rockingham? Yes. All right. Was item number 12 one of the last items collected on June 13th? Yes. And in terms of DNA concentration, was the concentration of item number 12, in terms of human DNA, higher significantly than the Bundy blood drops? It was. All right. And when that sample is handled in conjunction with the Bundy blood drops in the fashion that you've just reviewed on June 13th and on June 14th, does that create a danger of cross-contamination with that sample? Yes, because you're handling a sample that has a large amount of DNA with samples that have degraded and small amounts of DNA. And the samples that had degraded and small amounts of DNA were which samples? The Bundy blood drops. And Dr. Gerties, starting with what's marked as 47. Yes. Was that one of the Bundy blood drops that was handled by Dennis Fung and Andrea Mazzola on June 13th? Yes. 
was it one of the items that Mr. Yamauchi handled uh, at the same period that he was handling Mr. Simpson's reference sample? This is when Mr. Yamauchi took out the stopper and the blood went through the chem wipe onto his glove? That's correct. 48 the same? Correct. 49 the same? Yes. 50 the same? Yes. 52 the same? Yes. Now 52, in terms of which of the Bundy blood drop swatches were opened up from the bindles when Mr. Yamauchi began handling them on the morning of June 14th, which of the items did he handle first? Number 52. And in terms of the yield gels, 47, 48, 49, 50, and 52, what was the status of those samples in terms of bacterial degradation? They were all extremely degraded. Now, with respect to 52, is this the RFLP result that you are concerned about? Yes. How many nanograms of human DNA did Robin Cotton testify went into that particular result? She testified there was 25 nanograms. Is that different than all the other RFLP results? All the other RFLP results have more DNA. More. Four, at least four times more. That's correct, at least four times more DNA. Were any other of the samples from which RFLP results obtained, were those handled in the presence of the reference sample and in the period where the reference sample was handled? Objection, no foundation. Sustained. Is it your testimony, sir, that there were unacceptable risks of cross-contamination that are associated with the results on 47, 48, 49, 50, and 52? Yes. Do you recall ever seeing a picture of blood on that handrail? Yes, I believe I, I have seen that. Would it be fair to say that in terms of substrates, the handrail appeared similar in the photographs to the substrate on the back gate? Yes, again, you're asking me if it's generally similar. I think it was. It was white painted metal, as I recall. Now, you have done yield gels and slot blots on item 51, the blood stains from the front gate, have you not? Yes. And were the se and these were the ones collected on June 13th, right? That's my understanding. And from that substrate on the front gate, were not those blood stains substantially degraded? Yes, they were. Bacterial DNA. Well, it appeared to be bacterial. I didn't, again, remember I'm not doing a specific test for bacteria, but it has that degradation pattern like some of the Bundy drops was seen. So the results from the substrate on the front gate collected on June 13th were comparable to 47, 48, 49, and 50. Yes, they were comparable. And the results from the substrate of the handrail, you did yield gels and slot blots on that as well? Yes. And those showed those stains collected on June 13th from a substrate on the handrail, handrail substrate, those also were substantially degraded like 47, 48, 49, and 50. Yes, that's, that is correct. Now, 115, 116, and 117 were collected on July 3rd. That's my understanding, yes. That's the back gate, right? Yes, that's the rear gate. And those, as you've said, had no evidence of bacterial degradation. I, I did not see that pattern that we had seen on those other samples from Bundy. Now, I've asked you to look at, uh, you did a chart for the prosecution where you made a comparison of the amount of DNA in terms of nanograms per milligram, correct? Per milligram of swatch material, yes. All right, could you explain to the jury exactly what you mean by that when you're making a comparison of nanograms 
per milligram. Yes. What I wanted to look at was the basis of how much DNA we were recovering from some of these swatches against what the weight of the swatch material was. So you recall we talked about weighing all these swatches. I went back and I figured out how much DNA I got per each uh, milligram unit of the swatch material of the stains. And would, would it be fair to say that this is a, an analysis that tries to give you some notion of concentration? Yes. 117 was the stain taken from the back gates. And you know, there was something very strange about it, wasn't there? The blood drops at Bundy were degraded and had extremely low DNA concentrations. 117 had enough for an RFLP test. And you know who brought us that testimony? Gary Sims from the Department of Justice. Have you reviewed two charts we prepared at the break based on the data that you gave us on redirect examination in terms of nanograms per milligram? Yes, I have. So this is a comparison of the swatch DNA samples to 117, the rear gate sample. Yes, that's the comparison. The rear gate sample, number 117, has four times as much DNA on a basis of concentration, on a basis of nanograms to milligrams, as item number six. Yes. And that's uh, item number six is one of those blood drops found at Rockingham. Rockingham. And it has 27 times as much DNA as 47, one of the Bundy blood drops. Yes. And as far as 48 is concerned, another, another Bundy blood drop, it has 45 times as much DNA. Yeah. Yes. And as far as number 49 is concerned, it has 270 times as much DNA. Yes. And as far as number 50, another blood drop, it has 51 times as much DNA. Yes. And as far as number 52 is concerned, it has 11 times as much DNA. Yes. Now, with respect to 115 and 116, same comparison, 115 and 116 have about two times as much DNA as number six? Yes. Fifteen times as much DNA as number 47, a Bundy blood drop? Yes. Twenty-two times as much DNA as 48? Yes. 135 times as much DNA as 49? Yes. Twenty-five times as much DNA as 50? Yes. And six times as much DNA as 52? Yes. Thanks. Turning to the results from 117, the rear gate. Are you aware from your review of the testimony as to the amount of DNA on that sample? Yes, there's 150 nanograms. In your judgment, is that significantly different than the amount of DNA on the other Bundy blood drops? Yes, it is. Uh, do you know when that sample was collected? Uh, yes. When? I don't know the exact date but uh, I believe it was collected uh, in August. July 3rd? July, July. Later, after, a month or so after. Uh... Are you aware of Mr. Sims' testimony and assessment as to the level of bacterial degradation on item 117? Yes. Do you agree with it? Yes. Were those samples degraded? No. Dr. Gerdes, does it make any sense to you, based on your knowledge of DNA quantitation, that samples collected on June 13th from the same area, that is 47, 48, 49, 50, and 52, would be so degraded in terms of bacterial contamination, bacteria, and 117 would show no evidence of that? Objection, no foundation, calls for speculation. Sustained. Are you aware of the testimony that the same methods of collection were employed by Dennis Fung in terms of putting the swatches from 117 into a plastic bag, taking them to the laboratory, and drying them in test tubes, and sampling the next day, as was followed with 47, 48, 49, 50, and 52? Yes, I'm aware of it. Based on all of that, what is your assessment in terms of the data that the Bundy blood drops were severely degraded 
with bacteria, and the rear gate sample 117 was not, and the rear gate sample had 150 nanograms of DNA, which was five times higher than any Bundy blood drop sample. It, it doesn't seem to make sense to me that you, you should see about the same level of degradation, and in fact, on 117, which is an older sample, it should have more degradation. This supposedly has been out there from June 12th to July 3rd. And there's no question. Sunlight degrades DNA. Moisture and bacteria degrade DNA. Why are these concentrations so much higher? And another point. There's DNA concentrations, but there's also a separate test, as you've learned, when you look at those yield gels for degradation. These samples are not degraded. How can that be? Nothing. One additional note about the blood samples collected from the Bundy back gate on July 3rd, 1994. In this June 23rd, 1994 ABC News report, we learned that LAPD had returned to the Bundy crime scene for a closer and wider search for evidence. Isn't it curious that no one noticed the blood on the back gate? probably because it was not there. There were no public statements today from any of the principals involved in the O.J. Simpson case, but police did return to Nicole Simpson's townhouse, apparently for a closer and wider look at the scene of the crime. Here's ABC's Bill Redeker. Homicide detectives expanded the restricted area around Nicole Simpson's townhouse today, roping off an area around five buildings in all. They said they were resurveying the murder scene, but were not looking for a murder weapon. And what did you find, if anything, in that regard? That none of the latent prints that are recovered from the crime scene were identified to Mr. Simpson. Were there identifiable prints lifted from this black Cherokee Jeep? Yes, both of them were also palm prints. And uh, were you able to identify any individual with regard to these, the, these two identifiable prints? No. Briefly on the hat, we had testimony about dandruff. You heard Mr. Simpson's barber say that in the off-season, in the summer, in spring, he gets dandruff. Right after he's arrested, they remove known hair samples, his hair has dandruff. There's no dandruff in the hair in that hat. All that blood evidence. For more, visit OJSimpson.co. Thank you.